Okay, um, thank you very much everyone for coming to this Linguistics Department Seminar. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Cindy Schneider, who is an academic visitor. She's been here for a month or so and is here for another couple of months, I think. Um, so if you're interested in talking to her after the lecture, she will be around for a while. She's a senior lecturer at the School of Behavioral and Cognitive and Social Sciences at the University of New England, which is not in America, but in Australia, Armadale, New South Wales. Um, and she's been working on Pacific languages for about, about 10 years. Um, mainly in Vanuatu, but also with Papua New Guinea, which is the topic of the talk this afternoon. And she's worked in a variety of fields. Um, her background's in language documentation description. Her PhD was uh, descriptive grammar. Um, but she's also um, been working particularly um, on literacy, um, has conducted orthography development workshops, which is very well relevant for this week's um, uh, topic for our Applied Language Documentation Seminars, um, and has also been, was also taught English as Second Language and adult, adult, adult Literacy for 10 years, and therefore her linguistic interests are wide-ranging and she considers herself a generalist. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks, Julia. Thank you for the very generous introduction. Um, and thanks for inviting, thanks to Peter particularly, um, and everyone in the department for um, allowing me to come to SOAS and, um, and work here for a few months. It's a great opportunity for me. Um, so today, um, as you can see, I'm going to be talking about um, literacy planning um, in Papua New Guinea. Okay. So um, just a quick preview of the talk. I'm going to start out by talking about, by introducing you to um, the language that of, of focus, which is Kairak, and looking at the neighboring languages in the area, um, and then examining how literacy is used in the community in general. So literacy is used in a sort of a different way than um, we use it in a Western context. Then we're going to look at the um, educational policy um, for the national government, how this translates into policy implementation at the local level, and then uh, looking at some of the challenges that the schools face from implementing this policy, I'm going to make the suggestion that Tokpizin, rather than the vernacular, rather than the local indigenous language, Kairak, be used as the um, language in the classroom for teaching literacy. Um, now, obviously, I'm not, talk I'm not suggesting that vernacular literacy um, be canned um, in other schools, but I'm just talking about my one particular situation. And so you may wonder why um, this is relevant, but it actually can be very relevant, relevant to other communities because the types, of, the types of decisions that this local community made um, could easily be made um, in other communities. Um, so what's happened in this situation could easily happen in other situations, and I think it's, it's worth talking about. So um, here is a, a nice map of Papua New Guinea. Um, can this is pointer work? No. Uh, yeah. OK. So. This is Papua New Guinea. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with this part of the world, it's just north of Australia. Okay, so here's the northern tip of Cape York in Australia. Um, to the southeast are the Solomons, and then below the Solomons is Vanuatu and uh, New Caledonia. Um, New Guinea, the, the island of Papua is, Papua is shared with Indonesia. So basically to the west of this line is um, West Papua, the, pro the, um, the province that's in the news, at least in Australia. I don't know how much it's in the news in England. Um, and my field work is based in New Britain, um, on the island of New Britain. So this is the island of New Britain here. And New Britain is cut into two provinces, which are West and East New Britain. So I work in East New Britain, not far from Rabaul. Um, has anyone heard of Rabaul? No, okay. It's actually, um, it's an interest, it's a really interesting place. There's, um, it was, um, 
in the war, uh, the Japanese occupied Rabao for a few years. Um, in my field site, we found um, small handguns in, at the bottom of the river. Not me, but the people I lived with found a small handgun there that I have an, a photograph of. Um, there's an, an active volcano. The volcano erupted, I think, 1994, and it actually trashed Rabao completely. So Rabao, although it's written in capital letters here, really isn't, um, there's not many people living there anymore. Everybody's moved to Kokopo. Um, which is this little place over here. But my field site's a little bit in the hinterland of Rabao and Kokopo. So here's a, a language map of New, New Britain and New Ireland, which is the, map, uh, the island above New Britain. Um, and you can see that New Britain and Ireland and New Ireland are um, peopled by speakers of Austronesian languages and non-Austronesian languages. <coughs> so the Austronesian languages are um, um, spoken, they're dispersed all throughout the Pacific, basically, um, um, and Southeast Asia. It's a very large family. And then the non-Austronesian languages, the other name for non-Austronesian languages are Papuan languages. Um, there's a lot that we don't know about Papuan languages, um, except that um, we don't know how they relate to other language families or languages in other families, and we don't know how the languages relate to, how Papuan languages relate to each other. And um, Papuan languages are basically uh, mostly spoken on the, in Papua New Guinea, okay. Um, and he, here, as I pointed out before, here is um, East New Britain, and on the Gazelle Peninsula, that's where I'm gonna focus, um, and here's Kairak, okay, so that's the language of focus for today. Um, so you can see that um, the Gazelle Peninsula and this area is very linguistically diverse, okay, so just in the Kairak neighborhood, it's a small area, Kairak itself has be between um, 750 and 900 speakers, so it's, it's not a very large language. Um, very closely related to Kairak is Ura, um, which is you can see right here, has double the number of speakers, about 2,000. It's a much bigger language. Um, so that's about 15, 20 minute walk from the Kairak area is the Aura sort of stronghold where more Aura speakers live. Although they're all sort of interspersed with each other. Um, then you have in the same area, like 10 minute walk from the um, Kairak area is the Tawils. You can see that's not a, that's not a binding language. Oh, I, sorry, I should have mentioned the green area. All these languages in the green area, they're all binding languages, so they all belong to the same family. So all these languages are known to be related to each other and have um, language descriptions. To, um, some are well described, like Mali is well described. Um, Kairak is, I'm afraid, not well described. <laughs> not yet. Um, Kake is being worked on at the moment. Um, Aura, um, which is what we're going to talk about more today. Uh, missionaries have come um, and they've worked on Aura. They spent a lot of time working on Aura. Taolil um, is unrelated to Kairak. Um, there's someone working on Taolil at the moment, but um, not sure. It's how, how it fits in with the linguistic picture. Um, now, the Tolais are a group of people who are Austronesian speakers. They speak the Kuanua language. Um, they are latecomers onto the Gazelle Peninsula, so they pushed the, um, the binding people inland. Okay, So the binding people um, originally inhabited the entire peninsula, but the Tolais um, came and they, they took over, and they're still economically and socially dominant in the Gazelle Peninsula. Um, so there's also, relevant to this talk is, um, Kuan, uh, so we talked about Kuanua, Kairak, um, also Tok Pizen, okay, I should, I should specially mention Tok Pizen, so Tok Pizen is the lingua franca, uh, which is a common language, that means it's, it's a language of communication um, that um, people across the northern half of New Guinea speak. Okay, um, so it's not the home language of any one individual group, but um, all 
children start, you know, by the time they're five, they can speak talk pisin um, more or less well, reasonably well. And I don't really know anyone who doesn't speak talk pisin, um, anyone under the age of, say, 70 who doesn't speak talk pisin. Um, and English is the official language of government and education officially, although in practice, nobody um, speaks a whole lot of it. And we'll talk about English more later. So Kairak is in, situated in one of New Guinea's wealthiest provinces. It's a well-developed province. It's, it's a very nice place to do field work, I must say. Um, there's good road network. Um, like I said before, the, the binding people were, have been marginalized by the Tolai people um, who've pushed them inland. But actually, the Kairaks are, are starting to really come onto their, come onto their own. Um, they are traditional landowners in an area that um, people want to move to now. Um, land is becoming increasingly scarce, ex especially because of the volcanic eruption in the 90s. So people who had land near that volcano now don't have that land. And that's an ongoing problem of where do these people go. And some people have sort of tried to hang on and struggle and farm on land that's, you know, full of volcanic ash. Um, being optimistic. Some people have given up and they've moved inland. In the Kairak area, um, there are Kuanua speaking families, okay, Tolai families who have moved up there. Some of them have lived up there for a long time because of missionization. Um, also, the Kairaks are under negoti are negotiating um, contracts with foreign investors um, in copra production, etc. Okay, Christianity is a major um, influence in the lives of most people. Okay, so that's worth pointing out. It's an important point. And Kairak, I would say, is a language that's under threat. I looked at um, Ethnologue, um, which Peter was mentioning Ethnologue last week in his talk. Um, and Ethnologue gives a status to languages um, where one is a language of international importance and ten is an extinct language. And um, according to Ethnologue, um, Kairak is categorized as 6A, which is vigorous, which means that it's used for face-to-face -face communication by all generations and the situation is sustainable. Um, I would beg to differ, actually. I would, I would categorize it as 6 B, which is, there's a big, there's actually a really big difference between 6A and 6B. 6B is threatened, used for face-to-face -face communication within all generations, but losing users. And I think that's a fair depiction of the situation in Kairak. Um, now, let's just uh, talk about um, literacy, because although Kairak, I, as I've said, is is, is changing in the sense that there are fewer users and the place is modernizing and, and it's developing economically and socially. Um, it's still very different from, it still uses literacy in a, different, in a very different way from um, the West, or when I say the West, I mean places like England or Australia or the U.S., okay? So in the West, we use, we're, we're surrounded by literacy, especially, of course, at a university. Um, but in rural East New Britain province, which is where Kairak is spoken, in, in this area of the world, um, it's much more limited. Um, people do a lot of text messaging. That's one thing that people do. Um, if people go to town, okay, so the Kairak area where I am based is about an hour from town. It's not far. Pick up a newspaper written in English, English newspaper, bring it back. Um, so people have, you know, someone will bring back a newspaper. People will sort of leaf through it. Um, <clears throat> shopping lists. Um, there's a limited amount of workplace literacy. But in terms, if you walk down the street in the Kairak area, it's not like... Um, walking down the street in London or um, in Northampton or wherever, um, you're not confronted with, with signs everywhere. There's very little in terms of um, actual visual print, okay? 
So um, I would say that it's fair to say that literacy in the area is, is pretty limited. Um, it's not, it's non-pervasive. Um, and I can say that there's three characteristics of literacy um, in the area. It's first of all that I'd say that imported English literacy is very prestigious, but actually only a small percentage of people um, speak, read, or write English. Um, literacy is very highly multilingual, and I'll, we'll look at examples of that later. And literacy is a public activity, and I'll, ex I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, so. With, I'll explain what I mean using examples. So here's an example from a cocoa wholesaler. So someone um, in the area who's um, buying cocoa wholesale. The sign is basically written in using English vocabulary, you can see. But it's not entirely familiar, is it? Because the structure of the, of the signage is in not in English, but it's in using talk, it's written using talk written using talk pisin um, structures. So, for example, um, the future tense marker here, um, and the um, possessive construction days of working Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, and so. But you can see that um, in cases where the the, the, the talk pisin word is, is similar to the English word because talk pisin has the basis of its vocabulary does come from, from English for the most part. Um, instead of writing the words with a talk pisin pronunciation, and there is a talk pisin dictionary, so it is possible to write things in a talk pisin fashion, but rather than doing that, people just take the English word but put it within um, talk pisin structures. Here's another example. Here's a house win. Um, if you keep in mind the fact that um, this area is four degrees below the equator, what do you think a house wind is? <laughs> it's a place to cool off. Um, and again, so this is Gallium Teachers College, 2011 house wind. Okay, I, I'm arguing here that even though it's written in English, it's actually, it's a talk pisin phrase. You have the modifier following the noun, as you would expect in talk pisin. Um, here's another example where you have um, English words nested within talk pisin structures, church program for every or for all weeks. Um, I think the use of English is sort of a, a nod of um, a nod of acknowledgement to the to the authority of English literacy because English is so important um, in, in the schools but because people don't actually use English. If you actually had everything in English, um, there would start to be comprehension problems. And um, that's not what people want. <clears throat> the other thing that I, um, is true about literacy is that it's, it's very multilingual. So in the church, for example, even though we're in a Kairak area, um, the churches are um, Kuanua. Many of the churches use Kuanua, which is a the language that the Tolai people speak on the coast. Um, Tolai people were the first to be missionized. They have a Bible in their language, and so they took their bi they took their their religion and they went inland with it. So there were um, Kuanua missionaries, um, and so even though Kairak people may or may they most people understand Kuanua and they may or may not speak it, but it's there, okay, and people just accept it. You know, that's fine. They're not um, upset by that. Now, um, here's a video. I don't know if I... This is a video that shows... It's only 30 seconds. Um, and it shows... It's this woman reading from the Bible. Um, she's reading from an English Bible. Um, but she's reading English. A lot of people don't actually understand what she's saying. So... What she does is she translates into um, talk pisin and English and also in Kuanua. And so the point of the video was to show that um, literacy is sort of a public activity. It's shared and something that people do together because individually, um, individual capacity and ability varies so much. Do you want to see the video? Maybe. Um, 
Hey. Okay. Sorry, it's the quality is not great. I was. Oh wait, that's not the one I want. That's not the one I wanted. Wait, I wanted the other one. This one. <laughs> Stop. Okay, so um, that was the point of, of, of showing you that video, that people, um, you could see she's speaking, she was speaking three languages there, whether or not you caught it. Bottom right hand corner. Like that? That's good. That's good. So, um, yeah. It's it's a public activity. People don't normally read, people never read books. I've never seen anyone read a book. Like, people don't do that. People have Bibles um, and they'll occasionally read the paper, the newspaper, but people do not read. It's not, some, it's not something people do. Um, and so when people do read, like in this situation, it's a public shared activity be to, 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 to account for the fact that many people actually don't, re don't know how to read very well. Um, this is an interesting example. This is um, uh, a letter from the government sent to someone in the community, a, a, a community leader. And it's interesting I, I, that the letterhead, okay, so the national language, official language of New Guinea is English, okay, so the letterhead's in English, the, the stat, the, the um, dear Mr. Counselor is half in English, the, the job title is in, in English, but everything else, the, the subject line's in English, everything else is in pidgin, talk pidgin, okay, so I think this is really interesting because there's the nod to authority again, like this is an official letter from the government, I'm using English, but in order to actually communicate, talk pisin has to be used, okay? So that's, the, that's what's being used to communicate. And what's also, inter being, what's also interesting about this is that um, the person who received this letter hung this on the wall of his house the way you would hang um, your graduation certificate or something that you're proud of that you want to show people. So the reason um, that I think that this person hung the letter up is because um, it's a sign of prestige. Um, it shows that he's an important person in the community and it also shows um, that he's literate. And it also shows how important talk pisin is in terms of communicating with people in a language that they can understand. Um, so, um, Kairak and Ora. Let's go back to Ora. Remember, that's the language um, near, it's another binding language um, located very nearby um, Kairak. Um, closely related linguistically, they're, they, they're mutually intelligible. If one person speaks Kairak, then the Aura speaker can understand vice versa. But their literacy contexts are quite different. Um, Kairak isn't written at all, basically, except um, perhaps a greeting within a text message, but it has no um, history of reading. On the other hand, um, like I said before, the, that missionaries have come into the Aura area. Um, and um, over, over the past 20 years or so, they labored and they, uh, they translated four chapters of the New Testament into the Aura language. Um, and I was actually at the Bible launch for Aura in 2008, and it was a full day event with music and food and people sitting out in the sun, and, it was, and they sold the, the Bible. Um, and I couldn't get a copy because it had sold out, right? So every, every copy of this Bible sold out. It, um, it was very popular, so everyone wanted this Bible, and religion is important. 
So, um, but then a few years later, three years later, when I was back there, um, I was talking to the people who run the adult literacy school for Aura, and what they told me is that everyone had a copy of the Bible, but then nobody knew what to do with it because they couldn't actually read it. So what they did was um, they opened an, a school for adult literacy. So this is um, an example of the alphabet that the Aura people have been using. Um, and this school has grown by leaps and bounds. It's extremely popular. Um, it's doubled in population, and it doubled in population in a year. People are very keen to be literate in Aura. Okay, so the benefits of vernacular literacy are are very well known. Um, um, Students are always best off in um, learning literacy in their own language, their mother tongue. Um, and um, UNESCO brings up another very important point that when you learn to read, you only learn to read once. And then once you have that skill, you can translate it into, um, you can use your skill to learn to read in other languages. Um, students have the best chance of success at school if they've received their tuition initial literacy tuition in the mother tongue. So um, the New Guinea government, the Papua New Guinea national government, now endorses vernacular literacy, but this was not always the case. So um, the history of language planning and policy, that's what LPP stands for, the history of language planning and policy in New Guinea um, bef was English only, okay, until um, 1975 when Papua New Guinea became independent from Australia and um, starting in the 1980s there's um, all across the country um, grassroots sort of vernacular literacy schools started to crop up pop up of their own accord so just individuals, enthusiastic invi individuals within communities wanted to have adult literacy, wanted to have literacy in their schools and so they just started to do it themselves even though there was no official recognition um, of vernacular languages. Um, and then the government sort of cottoned on to this and so in 1989 they made um, a policy, a, a national language policy that endorsed vernacular literacy. Um, so it's really a case where the local practices motivated national policy. So um, the, gover the government um, says the right types of things, right? Every person has a right to become literate in the language they know best, okay? And in the curriculum, there is nominal, at least, nominal provision for the 800 languages of Papua New Guinea. So every school and every community has the right to teach, and you know they're encouraged to teach in the indigenous language of the area. Also, um, English is um, taught starting in year three, officially, and, and in most cases, I'd say even earlier than year three. Um, and nominally, the curriculum provides for Hirimotu, which is the lingua franca, the common language spoken in the southern half of the country, and Tokpizin, which is the lingua franca spoken in the northern half of the country. So uh, according to the government, um, Tokpizin and Hirimotu are considered to be the uh, languages of convenience, quote unquote. They're languages of convenience. Um, so. English is the language of communication and commerce, and um, the indigenous languages have heritage value, um, and it's part of the cultural fabric of the country. But Tokpizin is referred to as a language of convenience, and I think that's an interesting turn of phrase. Um, and I think it's true, that's how it's viewed, because it doesn't belong to anyone. It's not like um, it belongs to any particular cultural group. Um, but on the other hand, it's not a language of aspiration the way English is. It's just this, this 
thing in the middle. It's, it's, it doesn't have any real status. So, um, yeah, even though it's the most widely spoken language, in the, in the, at least in the northern half of the country, it doesn't really get any official recognition. It does get official. We'll talk about that in a second. It does get recognition, but not much. Okay. Um, so here's a ministerial policy statement. At the elementary level, prep, in other words, like kindergarten, the equivalent of kindergarten, Kindergarten to elementary level two, which is like year two or grade two, the language of instruction is completely in the child's vernacular or the community lingua franca um, with an introduction into oral English at the end of year two. Okay, children will leave elementary school literate in their first language. So I'd like to highlight that um, the community lingua franca in other words, talk pisin is mentioned. It is given a mention here, um, but uh, there seems to be, in my opinion, this preference for um, first language, and I think that's highlighted in the last sentence. So even though the lingua franca does, you know, does get some kind of mention, it's the the next sentence then reverts back to um, the first language. Um, and I think the reason for this, the reason why it's worded this way is, A, it really is optimal if you can become literate in your own language, in your first language, but also I think it's also due to the history of the way the language policy is developed in the country, that you had all these vernacular programs that then um, created impetus for a national policy favoring um, indigenous languages to be developed. So, there are two main objectives to the policy. Vernacular literacy followed by English only instruction. Um, but how do the schools deal with these two policies? Are they complementary or um, are they in competition? Well, um, the teachers um, have to work really hard to um, to teach vernacular literacy and then also to get ready for English literacy. So they think it's really valuable to teach vernacular literacy. Like at this, this is an orthography workshop that was held in 2008 and then we had another one in 2011. Um, they see, for example, that um, English speakers have their alphabet and they have literacy and look at English speakers, they're running the world, right? And then they see Aura speakers, Aura speakers have their own alphabet and they have a Bible. So I think they assume that um, if you have your alphabet, then alphabet leads, alphabet eventually translates to economic um, and social advantage for the community. So in the schools, the teachers try to present each language as a separate codified entity. So here's an example from the um, kindergarten class. Um, the A with the, the macaron over it is um, it's like, it's pronounced like the upside down V, it's a mid, back, vowel, unrounded, oh, oh, it's pronounced uh, okay. Um, then, uh, here's another example from the kindergarten class, what do you think this is? Months of the year, um, which parts borrowed from Bislama, from uh, Tokpizin? Um, all the months themselves, okay, so the, the, this part's written in Kairak and then um, the borrowings are in Bislama. Pre-nasalized pre voice stops, are they? December, November, October. No, they're not pre-nasalized. It's just December. They're not pre-nasalized. November. I see what you're saying. Yeah, why are they writing it? December. 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 Yeah. Interesting. February. Um, yeah. But, so you can see that even though uh, talk Pizen isn't officially supposed to be used in the schools, really, it has no place in the school. You're supposed to go from vernacular literacy to English 
and Tokpisin is not even mentioned, it's not, in this particular school it's not given any space at all, but it has to have space because it's so functional, it's useful. Um, it's, for example, there's, um, these are the months of the year. Is that because there aren't words like that in Korak? Yes. Well, there, there, I'm sure there would be words, um, off the top of my head, um, I can't remember, but I'm sure there'd be words that, that measure time, but people don't use them in the modern context. Um, so, it's like counting as well. Counting beyond like 20, it's even counting beyond 10 really. Um, and this is year one. This is taken in the year one class, a photo I took in the year one class. Okay, so year one you're not supposed to be doing English yet, but you can see this teacher decided to um, get a head start. Lots of, and Lots of really um, sort of culturally appropriate things like robot. ice cream, robot. Um, yeah. So um, here's this is from. Did I skip one? No, that's okay. This is from year two. Okay, this is from second grade. Um, this is something. This is a. Um, resource that was made in PNG, clearly, because it's, you know, it's culturally appropriate, and then the teacher has put in the, um, the words in Kairak for the students. No oh no, that's true. Well, I'd say this resource is probably 20 or 30 years old, maybe. I, I'm sure if they had a new resource, they'd put a mobile phone in there. <laughs> Um, here's a, a th and this year too, teacher I might add is particularly, um, she's really, really dedicated. Um, she's made heaps of materials. This is um, uh, another thing that she made. Um, this is the theme. Okay, so now we're in year two. So you're supposed to be, you're supposed to be teaching the children oral English. Okay, but she's, she's, you know, getting them started. Theme, garden, okay. Now, um, the description is written in Tokpizin here. Um, and can you, if you can guess any of the words, talking about the garden plants, what else? What? Mary, you cut them grass. Yeah, well, that, you and Mary, Mary is woman. Yeah. Mary, yeah, the Mary. Yeah. Oh, now because it's place where all men not marry. Man and men and women cut the grass. Um, blah blah blah. Um, and so, if you keep in mind that the Tokpizin alphabet is completely borrowed, I mean it's it's appropriated from English. Um, can you spot the spelling error? Keeping in mind that this is. Um, written in English and in Tokpizin, even though Tokpizin shouldn't be written or English shouldn't be written at all in year two. Can you spot the the spelling error? Okay. Look at this. Okay, what has this person done? How does how is this pronounced? It's pronounced like oh, uh, so garden. Okay. So even the teacher um, who's um, talented and skilled and dedicated has um, it's 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 there's a lot of a lot to sort of untangle she's working um, basically with with three languages um, so it shows that even the, the teacher can get confused by the multiple alphabets um, it, it's can, can be quite confusing um, so here is the teacher per, uh, I, I don't think we have the time to talk. If we have time at the end, we can um, look at this. Hey, do you want to see? It's a 30 second video. Okay. Um, and yeah, just you'll, you'll very quickly see, I think, what she's doing. This one's not as loud. Oh, come on, where is it? Oh, wait, 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 okay. Wait, wait, start again.
This is a video taken by someone who has not attended ELDP SOAS language documentation classes. <laughs> and you can see the result. So, um, what was she doing? What was, she, what was she teaching them, do you know? She was... Yeah, she was contrasting the English with the Kyrak alphabet. Um, so there's a lot of, the, you know, there's a lot of linguistic sophistication in um, in the with the children and lang language and literacy learning is multi a multilingual affair. Um, but the, there's a lot of practical challenge. There are many practical challenges to the to the literacy program. First one being the teaching materials. So. Um, Lidicote says, a well-known um, language planner, says the effective implementation of the syllabus depends on the nature and supply of the teaching materials. So any teaching materials that they have in the vernacular are made by the teachers, okay? And that's great if your teacher is invested and willing to spend the time, but not all teachers actually are. Some are more than others. Um, in this school that I went to. There's only two schools, um, Kyrak elementary schools anyway. The one I went to, the year the year two teacher and the prep teacher were both pretty invested. The year one teacher just wasn't, you know. Um, the he he didn't um, he hadn't gone to the workshop um, and he didn't have any materials in the classroom in Kyrak. So he was, he was just more invested. His motivation was teaching English literacy. So he obviously thought that English literacy was more important for them. So when you have these two policies um, meant to be complementary but more likely competing, this is what happens, okay? Um, so that's just a practical reality. That's the reality. Um, Again, like well, what I've just said, the the, uh, the policy objectives are competing with each other. The year teach, the year two teacher in particular has has a major challenge because they know that starting in year three, the, these children are going to go into primary school, which is a different school, and um, they really do shift pretty heavily into English because I went to those school those classrooms as well to the year three classrooms. And the teachers aren't necessarily Kyrak speakers. In fact, most of them are not. And um, so there's a lot of talk pisin and English in primary school. And the year three teachers are far more serious about actually speaking English in the classroom. They really are at least the ones I visited, but they may have been doing that because I was there. You can never tell when you're going to a, into a classroom. You don't know how people are changing their behavior. But the major challenge, really, for um, this classroom is that a sizable minority of the students in, in the classroom do not speak Kairak. They are from the Taulil area, okay? So L1 is, stands for first language. So the first language of um, many of the students, um, I think it's like, it's written in a notebook in Australia, so I don't have the exact number, but I think it's about 40% of the students, um, but I'm, it's 40% more or less in that classroom are not Kyrak speakers, they speak Taulil. And if you recall, Taulil is not even, it's not like Aura where it's sort of related and, and mutually intelligible with Kyrak. It's not at all related um, to Kyrak. And yet these children are, not, are going to a school where they're learning Kyrak literacy in the Kyrak vernacular literacy. Um, so they're basically replacing English as a second language with um, Kyrak as a second language. Um, so why is this happening? Well, it, the school happens to be situated right on this boundary area between the Talil and the Kyrak area. Um, and so it's close. It's just close by to the Talil area. Um, and so parents um, send their kids there. Um, some of them 
are probably not aware of what their kids are doing. You have to keep in mind that many of the parents really don't have a lot of education um, themselves, and so they're not very well equipped to oversee the education of their children. And they p place a lot of faith in the teachers and in the schools. And they're, they're assuming that the teachers in the schools are, um, are doing um, the right thing, I suppose. And from the school's perspective, if you think about it from the teacher's perspective, they're doing their job, right? They're carrying out the policy. The policy is that you teach either the vernacular or the lingua franca um, in elementary school. So because so many schools, because of this history of vernacular literacy, and it, it be, because it's viewed as such a good thing and a positive thing, um, the schools, I think what these teachers have done is they've just taken that and run with it. They're not really trained to interpret or analyze the language policy. So um, even though the, it does allow, the policy does allow for teaching in the lingua franca, um, I think the default option is literacy in the vernacular. So, um, and then the other major problem is functionality. Like there's just not enough out there in Kyrak for students to have any motivation to read. So even if you do speak Kyrak as your first language, um, you don't, there's no, um, you don't use it for anything except for your class. Um, so, um, if it's only a school-based activity um, with no um, no other function, um, that can actually undermine the value of learning the the vernacular. It's just like anything. I'm sure. Everyone's when they've been in school, you learn. You have to take some class that you you might not even enjoy, and then if you don't see the functional value in it, you you resent it even more, right? Um, so it could be even counterproductive. Um, Kulma says that um, if you know literacy has never been part of the tradition, the speech community may have no use for it. And Mule Heusler says that um, new literates, if there's no functionality for the literacy, new literates frequently and rapidly revert to illiteracy. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, this is just something I'm going to skip over. But basically, the point is that um, you can see it's, it's challenging enough for the teachers and the students in the schools to, to, to teach and to learn. And so you would hope that the language policy facilitates as much as pos possible learning and teaching. And that's why I see um, talk pison as a viable alternative, because A, the, the policy already allows for it, and it is taught already. Um, in the cities where there's a lot of population ling linguistic mixing, and even in this area, near um, near the Kayak area, there is a talk prison school. Because what I forgot to mention is that there's a teachers' college nearby, and the teachers' college has people from all over New Guinea, like trainee teachers coming, and they bring their families with them and their kids. So you have all these kids from different first language backgrounds going to that school. But it's not only for the, the children of the teachers. Anyone can go to that school. So um, that talk business school is, is there, even in that in the area, in the local area. If, if the children didn't speak it, I would certainly wouldn't think it was a good idea. But children speak the language. It's not. Um, their first first language, but by the time they reach school, most of them speak it at least reasonably well. And if they don't speak it reasonably well on day one of school, they start they they will speak it well um, because a lot of their classmates um, have parents with mixed linguistic backgrounds, where the father and the mother speak different languages. So the children of those parents are speaking talk pis they grow up speaking talk as their first language anyway and they don't speak the vernacular so the kids even if they don't speak it well they have to communicate with their other classmates and they use talk pisin. okay so it's the vernacular students the vernacular speaking kids switching the talk pisin to accommodate the talk pisin speaking children rather than vice versa 
Okay. There's more resources for teachers to draw from. Okay. What about the argument that, you know, literacy, you know, literacy helps to um, save the language? Well, there's really no um, evidence for that. Okay. Reading and writing doesn't guarantee uh, transmission. Kyrak was healthy for a long time and it was never read, read or written. Um, it's not, it's vulnerable now because um, some parents aren't using it with their children. Um, the other thing is that talk pisin's already a de facto language, written language anyway. You can see it, it, it's pervasive um, in the community and in the schools, even though it's not officially acknowledged. So it doesn't um, disrupt the language ecology, quote unquote, the way. Um, vernacular literacy may. And what I mean by this is like Mulehoisler again says that um, if you write down a language that has never been written before, you can potentially endanger the linguistic ecology of the area because um, by writing one language and then you're not writing another one, then that can put everything out of balance. Um, and he gives examples from the Pacific. Um, but that aside, Talk Pisan, since it's already written anyway, you don't have that potential problem. Deary, now Peter last week was talking about Deary. That was, had a grammar developed for it in the 70s and 80s, literacy materials in the 80s, but Ethnologue called it extinct, right? So that doesn't seem to make a difference. But what has made a difference for Deary, it seems, from what I understand about what Peter was saying, was that the economic and the social development is what gave people a bit of a lift, which gave them the headspace so that they could, had the luxury to think about maintaining their language. I know it's a different type of situation, but it's just an example. Um, OK, so. Um, how does language policy fit into all this? So macro versus micro. Macro policy, what macro refers to sort of high level policy, micro policy, micro, m macro and micro is like high level sort of general governmental level. Micro is local community level. Policy is like what you want to do with your language and planning is how you implement that. So like policy is statement of intent versus implementation. So who's taking the initiative here? So um, in the case of New Guinea, what happened first was that you had grassroots implementation um, at an unofficial level, which prompted macro level planning or policy making, which in turn, once that decision had been made, that policy had been made that we're going to have vernacular literacy, that then prompted all these communities that had not yet initiated a vernacular literacy program to start making some decisions about what are we going to do in our school. Okay, so it's not really evident though that this community made some made a, a sort of a very active um, whether it's not evident they actively developed a policy but it, it what is evident is that they looked to their neighbors the aura speakers who already had an orthography and who already had development in their language and thought this looks like this is what we will take. So they, they adopted the alphabet and they adopted the policy of the aura speakers. Um, but what's good for one group isn't necessarily appropriate for the other. And if they had thought about it more carefully they, and thought about, well, you know, if we have a school where almost half the children don't actually speak that language, maybe we shouldn't. Um, be offering vernacular literacy in just one language, um, they probably would have decided not to. But I think there's just a lot of um, sort of as assumption that if it works for one community, it can. If it, you look to your neighbor for for um, guidance, I think. Um, and I think it's because the benefits of vernacular literacy in this case have been misunderstood and overstated. 
Um, so in the planning, okay, that's the implementation um, at the macro, the macro level, at the government level, they're creating lots of materials in English, which is great, but um, at the micro level, anything related to vernacular literacy, it all has to come from the local teachers, everything, and like the, developing the orthography. If they don't have any, I was there, I came in several years after the initial orthography had been developed and we, we worked on revising it and they were very happy to revise it because they could see there were some problems with it. But I just happened to come through, you know. What if I hadn't, you know. There's loads and loads of languages where nobody, no, no, you know, peop, the communities are doing it completely on their own. Completely on their own. Um, resourcing and support um, at the government level in, in uh, Moresby, they've got you know consultants and language planners, and they've got research that they can refer to to help them with their decision making. But at the community level, um, it's they're very much left to who happens to come through, they're left to their own devices, and, um, and they make their own decisions, which is good, but it can also be difficult if you don't have enough um, assistance and expertise. So if you consider the entire picture and who's taking the initiative in which areas of planning and implement, of policy and planning, and if you think about what the resourcing is like and the minimal support that the communities actually receive for making um, important decisions, then you can sense the impending danger of um, what I call copycat policy. So that's when you use your neighbor's policy as a basis for your own. Um, but in the case of Kairak and Ora, they have very different situations. Ora has double the population. It's got, you know, some... And double the population is important which because they you can have entire schools filled with one group of speakers, okay? They've got something at least. Only, you know, they've got some part of the Bible that's something better than nothing. And you've got like this sort of fervent group of, of literacy users in the adult population who can then, who they transmit that enthusiasm to their own children. So they have some interest in literacy. But um, the Kairak population is sort of politely interested in literacy when I'm around, but they, I don't think they really care very much, to be honest. Um, the teachers care. The teachers care, but um, they don't use it. So. Um, I think then that like when, when you have micro planning, micro planning really needs to be like at the local level. You're planning for your local community and that is valuable because you're looking specifically at your community and that is inherently very variationist. But when you're sort of looking to your neighbor, which is a very natural thing to do if you need assistance and you're not sure what to do, then what you have really is um, sort of macro planning in disguise, really. It's just like, well, let's take their plan and apply it to me, to us. Um, macro planning's fine, but it doesn't cater to the needs of the individual communities the way that micro planning does. So, um, optimally, in a stable, homogeneous community, um, vernacular literacy in the first language, of course, is is optimal, but that's not the necessarily that's not the case for other types of communities. So when I'm suggesting that um, in a multilingual classroom in a rural area like this, that talk pisin is probably a better option, am I sort of stating the obvious? Well, yeah, m you might think so. You might think, why have I sat here for an hour to listen to this? But it's not necessarily obvious to people in communities where the importance of the vernacular has sort of been overemphasized at the expense of every, all other considerations. And um, communities at the local level really need that support um, 
in analysis and, and in planning to make good decisions or otherwise, their natural inclination will indeed be to look to your neighbors for um, inspiration. Um, and that's all. Thank you. A lot of time. Okay, sure. Lydia. Um, is it not also stating the obvious to say that there could be a separation between um, emphasizing the importance of the of the local language and focusing on literacy, which could be into a <coughs> um, and having those two be separate things, right? In the classroom, people are taught that their language is valuable, but not Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, good point. That's a good point. It's true. Because, yeah, you don't, it's um, just because you don't teach, even if you don't teach, these people are teaching literacy in the vernacular, but say they, they decided not to, um, that doesn't mean that they can't talk about the importance of the vernacular and, and, value, and use the vernacular. Why not use the vernacular? Um, but then they also need to use, the, they need to use the other vernacular as well. <laughs> Um, so, or cut it into two different schools, for example, have two different schools, but that's not happening <coughs> at the moment. Uh, sorry, first, yep. Uh, you talked about the community making decisions, um, but you also said that the other was diagnostic about literacy. So, I mean, how, do, how does the community make decisions? Is that a sort of formal? Well, I think it's, it's uh, like in 2002, um, which was some, quite, quite a few years after the policy decision in 1989 to, for vernacular <coughs> literacy, um, there was the first vernacular literacy workshop. Okay, that was the first Kyrak writing workshop where they sort of formulated the alphabet. And, um, so I think it's whoever is interested is basically involved in the decision making. Yeah, so um, typically it's um, important people, sort of big men, pe important people in the community, teachers are invested in that. So it's usually a group of people, like also, um, like the the pastor, um, pastor and pastor's family is involved in that kind of decision making. People who who have a profile in the community make these types of decisions. So um, yeah. And that first vernacular workshop. So was that uh, their, the community's initiative to do that, or was that something? Else? That was SIL. It was an SIL thing that they brought to the community and then the community was involved in it. The one in 2002? Yeah, that first one. Yep. Peter? Thanks for the, the talk. It was really interesting. But I wonder if there isn't an, a sort of ideological dimension to, that you haven't really talked about. Um, you touched a little bit on issues of evaluation and what people consider to be to be valuable or not valuable and so on, and aspirational. But English and English literacy is something to aspire to. Um, I think there's also this sort of ideological uh, position, which is, you know, we're all one talks, we should all, you know, love and support and whatever our, our own language. But talk person is something that you just put up with, you know. You need it, you have to use it, but nobody really wants it to be there in, in, a, in any kind of ideological sense. And, and those views are sort of supported also by organizations exactly like SIL and um, the uh, consultants and advisors that you, that you mentioned. Um, we had a nice in, a case of this a few years ago. We had a student who was working in Burkina Faso and what she found there was that the missionaries, the consultants, the outsiders, the linguists were all saying your language, and then sort of French, 
But what the local community did was they had a lingua franca that was used in church and everybody wanted. And there was no, you know, no question to them that they were going to shift to that. They just used it. They, they kind of put up with it and so on. So there was a conflict of ideology between the, the viewpoint taken by the local community mm -hmm. and this other ideology which is being promoted by the government and the consultants and SIL and linguists and outsiders. And those two are really banging into conflict. And I think what you're suggesting is putting that lingua franca into the middle there, you've got no traction there because neither ideological position would support it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. And I actually, this, this was in, um, in Vanuatu, where, where they speak Bislama, which is, is an, another dialect of Melanesian pidgin. So Tokpizan and Bislama are related to each other. And I just happened to um, stay in the same guest house as these people who worked for the Department of Education. And we were talking about Bislama. In the school, and it's the same thing in Vanuatu, where um, um, Bislama is basically ignored in the school. And I was asking them, "Well, what do you what do you think about Bislama? Um, don't you think it has some sort of useful um, function at some level as a bridging language because you're using it anyway? You, you're, um, why don't you acknowledge it?" And they they don't. Yeah, it's like it's like the orphan. It's an orphan. It's an Ideological orphan, I suppose. It doesn't belong. To, it it doesn't have status. Um, Bislama and Tokpis in the same. They, they they don't have status as or value for because they're not English. So they don't have that. They're not aspired to, but they're not. They don't have that. Not custom. Yeah, they're not custom. So. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a problem, but, you know, it's, some of these kids, some of these kids, they don't speak a, any language, but they still, I suppose you could say they still belong to that, you know, you could say, well, my mother is um, Taolul and my father speaks Kairak and, or whatever, you know, but, yeah, it's, I don't know, I don't have a solution to that, but it's a practice, it, in practical terms, if you want to increase the literacy um, in the country, if that is something that you genuinely, genuinely want to do, then I think you should take some steps to try to improve it, improve the situation. And a lot of it is just, it, I mean, I'm not saying, um, I, think it, I think you can promote the vernacular and you can also promote talk pizen. It's It isn't a, a valuable and useful language if it would only be acknowledged. Sorry, um, Itesh. Is there a Bible in talk pizen? Yes. OK, and then this is a very basic question. I don't know much about pigeons and creoles. Is talk pizen a pigeon or a pigeon? It's a creole. OK, I mean. Um, it's a krill. It's spoken as a first language by lots and lots of people. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's called pigeon, um, but it's it's a krill. It's a krill. It's, uh, it's Julia. Um, oh, no. um, I just have one point to make kind of building on Peter's point about whether there is a kind of ideological framework in which um, like the Melanesian pigeon is um, kind of valued. And I know like in my experience in Vanuatu, I came across some speakers who, especially when people were visiting from the Solomon Islands or from PNG, they were really excited by this kind of like cross-nation common ground. So maybe that's kind of one angle which could be yeah. as a okay. way of doing that. That's interesting. Like building a community of me like kind of Melanesian, Melanesian yeah. Because it, I mean think about I don't know, think of smoking or something, right? I mean that's probably a bad an analogy. <laughs> but think of I mean smoking had this certain appeal what, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, if you smoked, you were, um, you've, you matched a certain profile, right? 
you were, and I still think if you smoke, you're sociable, you have a better social life and things like that. <laughs> but not anymore, not anymore. But the public information campaign, public information campaign, I think has, has changed opinions. And I'm not saying you, you don't, you want to ignore the vernacular, you certainly don't, but you want, why not promote this language that everybody in the country speaks? It's a, it's, it should be a source of national pride, really. Um, Julia and then um, um, Sophie, yeah. No, I, I think you're right that the pigeon or creoles definitely mixed language is basically the, the lowest of the low in terms of prestige. Um, it's what it's called a prestige planning tends to get left out. Of, of language planning and policies. So, um, in other places where they have promoted, or let's say, decided to use the lingua franca, the, 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 the local Creole, mm -hmm. as a language of education, and forgotten to raise its prestige, um, the parents turn around and say, We want our children to learn a proper language. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the problem then is that if you raise the prestige of, of the lingua franca, you may increase language shift. But maybe you won't. <laughs> but, okay, yeah. I mean, that's... A few dead languages later. <laughs> well, can't you... die anyway. <laughs> 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 no, there are people are voting with their mouths. They're talking pissing, talk pissing. So, the shift is happening anyway. Mm. Yeah, I wasn't clear, Fletcher. I wanted to ask you to what extent is that is language shift happening? You talked about some kids. Yeah, okay. So, oh, it, it's common because the area is very mixed. It's very, very mixed. Um, there's been a lot of economic development, but along, along with all that, and there's really good infrastructure. They now have electricity, so they watch English TV. A lot of the TV is, it's mostly in English, actually. I got to watch lots of um, whatever that show is. Anyway, um, no, no, sixty minutes, tick, 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 um, <laughs> counter. Um, yeah, lots of English TV, talk pizin, um So it's happening, and there's a lot of intermarriage. Okay, like the family I worked. For, with or the family I lived with, sorry, um, the the wife was from um, Garoka. Kids don't speak Kairak because the mother is a real. You know, I mean, the mother just speaks to them in in pidgin all the time. And Kairak and these languages, um, the Binding family is sort of notoriously thought of as being a very difficult. You know, the, so the, the Tolai people on the coast, the Kuanua speakers, say that, oh, Kairak and Ura, they're very, very difficult. Their language is really hard. Our language is easy. And the Kairak people actually say the same thing. They say, yeah, our language is hard. Tolai's, um, the Kuanua is actually very easy. And so um, in that sense, too, and personally, I mean, having worked on both an Austronesian language in Vanuatu and this language in PNG, I mean, like, in terms of language complexity, I'm sorry, but I think some languages can be more complex than others. And this language is, this Papuan language, and Papuan languages, I think, are known for being more complex. And this language is certainly, Kairak language is certainly more complex than the language I worked on um, in Vanuatu. That's being recorded too. Oops. But uh, yeah. Um, so there's shift from that. I mean, I'm not sure how significant that is, but there is this sense that like this language is really hard, and so people who marry into the community tend to not learn the language, and the kids don't. And so when your your mother's not speaking to you in language. Um, there are a lot of kids that don't speak it. I know there's one family, there's a Kuanua speaking family. They came from the coast a long time ago. So the kids um, with Kuanua speaking parents grew up there in the fa grew up in the neighborhood. Um, they don't speak any 
um, Kyrak at all either. Well, I guess it's not surprising, but yeah, there's there's um, <clears throat> in that family too, the Kuanua speaking family. Um, there are two sisters. One sister learned Kyrak, the other one didn't. You know, there's there's a variation, but a lot of people move into the area and they don't learn the language because they don't need to. They can use pidgin. Um, oh, sorry, Sophie. You're saying remind me a lot of the area I work in Nigeria, so the multilingualism and so on and so forth, and also, so I met you, yeah, yeah. and then I see the pictures of the primary school teachers, and they're all members of the local community, mm. and that's where the difference comes in, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of members of the local community where I work that are teachers, and there's a lot of teachers in the school, mm -hmm. but the government just I know they do the same thing in Vanuatu. But apparently not. They don't do that here. No, it's good. What they do here is they, yeah. it's very good. In Vanuatu, they do the same thing. They take a person, they send them on the other side of the country. So I was wondering who posts the teachers. Is it the schools that demand the teacher or is it the government that sends them? And if the government sends them, there would be another way in which they actually support their own policy in practical terms. Well, no, these teachers are local, te they, they speak the local language. Except for the yeah, I mean, at least it's sensible in that way. Like the these teachers are are Kyrak speakers; they speak Kyrak. Yeah, it certainly helps. <laughs> it it does help. Um, it, it seems it seems to me that what the Kyrak language is missing is the, you, you mentioned that for the uh, Ura, Ura that they have divided two. So what? Kerak people are missing is something to read. So maybe this, is there a possibility of addressing that? Yeah, I mean, I suppose that's something I could do, is translate the Bible. I know that Nick Evans, <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, it's, I could, I, it's not something I'm personally very interested in. I mean, I'm not a missionary, but there, that's what the demand is for. I mean, people, I don't know whether the children really care about reading the Bible, but certainly the parents are interested in the Bible and reading the Bible. And Nick Evans, who works in southern New Guinea, um, I hear that that's what he's doing. They want him to translate the Bible, so he's spending part of his time on, his, on the language that he's working on in southern New Guinea, um, doing Bible translation. Peter? There is an alternative. What? Nick Tiberger has tried it out, I know, in several places. It's comics. The, fan, <laughs> the phantom comic, the, you know, something okay. that the kids really love. Yeah, yeah. And really easy because they just got the little speech balloon. You yeah. can put any language in there that you want to have. Yeah. Um, and it's way more appealing than. I mean, the Bible, it, the Bible is just cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> the presence of the Bible there is not something for people to read. It has an iconic mm -hmm. value as being somewhat connected with, with the church, with the pastor. The pastors have political power, mm. they have money. You know, the churches yeah. are rich and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's the connection with the Bible. If you actually want people reading, then give them stuff that they enjoy reading. Um, Cartoons, manga, whatever they have. You have to make a lot of cartoons. Yeah, I mean, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cheap and easy to produce, black and white, photocopy them. But you need it for other. Th I mean, you need. You need sort of depth. You need more than just one thing. You need, like, oh. lots and lots and lots. But the thing is, people. I mean, people really just don't read very much. That's. Neither, neither do they in the West. Yeah. yeah, but in the West you have to read. I mean, you, you can't get by if you don't read. Well, I mean, it's really, really hard. It's very hard to get by in this community if you don't read. Pe people do, but they, it's, they, they have to hide it because it's such, they feel ashamed. You, it's, and which is terrible that they feel ashamed because but, you know, if you can't read in this community, I, I think it would be very hard. You'd, you're at a real disadvantage. Whereas there, you're not at a disadvantage because reading and writing are public, public um, activities. It's a pub reading and writing is something that you're not necessarily expected to do because 
Um, other people can do it for you. And it's not, um, it's, if you can't read and write, people do feel a little bit ashamed if they can't read and write, but it's, um, especially nowadays because education's becoming more important, but still there are an awful lot of people who, who still can't read and write and who depend and who get by quite well without reading and writing and when it's called on they can easily lean on someone else to do that and other people sort of seem to know that that's their job. It's part of the culture. It's an oral, you know, it's an oral culture. Um, sorry, I've forgotten your name. Uh, Alice. Alice. Um. Identity. Do they do they see themselves as, as, a, as the Kyrax community, or do they see, do they identify with the place there? No, they they say they, they see themselves as Kyrax. And yeah. what about those who and bindings? Where do they or do they do they also identify with the Kyrax like just, just in a, as a small unit or as part of different? I think um, Kyrax, okay, so like Kyrax belongs, they're part of the binding family and so there are certain things that all the binding people do, like for example fire dances um, and mask making. So there are certain things that, um, that um, the larger grouping of, of people who live in the Gazelle Peninsula, um, that whole green covered area on the map, they identify themselves as binding people. But within the binding people, people view themselves also as part of the smaller clans, Kairak and Ura and Mali and Kaket. Um, and then the Taolils are very, they really are very different. They are very different. They're, they're religious, they're Catholic. Um, you, it, when you walk into the Talil area, it feels different. It really does. Like it's, it's just got a different um, vibe to it. <laughs> I can't explain, but it, it feels quite different. It's just down. The, it's like ten minutes away, but they're they're different areas, and they view themselves as distinctive, and they are. And are they interested in communicating with each other? Oh yeah, I mean they. They communicate with each other all the time because they live so. They're neighbors. They all know each other. Um, yeah. But they are. They ha they have their own identity. Yeah. Does that? I don't know if that's. If I, I was just wondering what the, what the exact how far the path is stretched to become part of the How, how? Because if they would, in that case, they would use talk person to communicate with each other. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And just maybe the further they go, the, the better it would be to be able to write. Talk person everywhere. I mean, really, like if you want to communicate on a national level, or just you, you, you really do need to use talk person. And that's the really ironic thing. I also find it very ironic in Vanuatu as well. It's the same thing, like, it's not given any real, um, it doesn't have any value. It's not valued, but everybody needs it. You know, everyone really needs it. And so there's a lot of variation in the way it's written. I mean, it does, I don't think it really matters if there's a lot of variation in the way it's written as long as people understand it. But, um, in the case of Bislama in Vanuatu, like there's a dictionary, at least one dictionary made for Bislama. Um, there's probably a really old dictionary of Tokpizin. Like so, outside linguists have come in and they've 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 developed materials, but it really hasn't um, taken off. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose they they develop materials focusing on the language. Literacy instruction, but if there are material, not really materials, but the information that that the language is 
describes them, that information would be something that became valid, that everybody wants to know. Because the language, the literacy, that's just a vehicle to get to some sort of information. So maybe the information that they want isn't it's not isn't as interesting in Mm-hmm. You mean in Kairat? No, in, in Tokpism. In Tok um. I think um, we have to just continue this, this discussion in the pub, I'm afraid, because we have to uh, get out of this room now. But uh, thank you very much, Devin, for coming. Thank you. for this very interesting and lovely talk. And um, please join us at the Institute of Education for talk. Turn off these recordings.